Coming up on Plane Crazy Down Under, we're joined by Lockheed Martin F-35 test pilot Tony Brick Wilson to discuss his flying career and find out a little about his amazing role. Every Australian aircraft that has come off of the, the line, either I or a member of my team have flown it. And as this fifth generation jet continues to evolve, Director of F-35 International Business Development, Stephen Over, talks about coming upgrades we can expect on RAAF models. This year we're breaking into production a new computing baseline that will update the main mission computer on the aircraft, the computer that supports the, the cockpit displays and the aircraft memory system. High flying, high tech, and one of the coolest jobs on earth. It's all ahead as we get plain crazy. Well, hi everyone. Welcome back to the show. It's great to have you with us. This is, of course, the program where we like to uh, take a look at Australia's aviation industry and, of course, aviation all around this part of the world. I'm Steve Vischer. Joining me, as always, my good friend Grant McHeron. How are you, mate? Hey, not too bad, buddy. How are you doing? I'm doing very well and, of course, uh, really looking forward to this episode. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm always doing well when we're about to talk about fast jets. And uh, we've got a really good guest waiting for us who we'll introduce in just a few minutes. We're going to be covering the F-35, of course, which is a uh, maturing platform, of course. We've covered this before. I remember back to episode 119, Grant, when we first started uh, really looking in depth at the, uh, the F-35. I think that was probably back in about 2014 or somewhere around there. And uh, it's uh, certainly become a, you know, a mature platform these days. And uh, you know, a lot has happened and a lot of development has gone on. It certainly has, mate. And uh, the big key phrase that we're hearing again and again is, of course, sensor fusion and how the F-35 brings everything together. So the pilot doesn't have to build their situational awareness from multiple screens and inputs from all the different sensors, but the actual platform does it for them. And, uh, mate, I think we should get straight onto it because uh, we've got Tony Wilson, Chief of Fight or Flight Operations at Lockheed Martin on standby. Should we get straight into it? Let's do it. Well, good day, Tony. How are you doing? Oh, fantastic. I really appreciate uh, you guys having me on. This is, uh, I'm really excited about this. Well, Tony, we'll kick off with the most important question of all, and it's not going to be about your call sign of Brick, which we'll also refer to you as, but uh, we'll come to that later. Uh, what got you into aviation? You know, I, I think uh, this, the story of what got me into aviation is not really different than any other uh, aviation geek or, you know, nerd out there. Uh, you know, we all come from a place and we all have some sort of connection with it. Mine came from my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather had a love of aviation and from as long as I can remember, uh, he used to take me to the airport and we would watch, sit there and watch planes and we would bond over it. Uh, and, but I can tell you the moment uh, that was solidified for me of when I would pursue this career. I grew up in South Florida in uh, the early and mid 70s and we took a trip up to kennedy space center before the space shuttle had uh, been flying but they had a life-size model of the shuttle parked outside of the rocket assembly building and i can remember coming around the corner and and looking at this awesome machine and i turned to my teacher and i said hey how do i get to fly that and she's like well tony you have to be one of the best test pilots in the world to get to do that. And I was like, ah, I can do that. Now, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm the best test pilot or one of, even I'm a mediocre test pilot at best, but that was what really uh, propelled me into this career. Because Florida really has a really rich aviation uh, scene there, doesn't it? I mean, there's, there's, there's so much going on in aviation there. It's probably hard not to get hooked if you live there. Yeah, a absolutely. You have Kennedy uh, Space Center, uh, multiple uh, service bases, you know, McDill, Homestead, uh, Fort Lauderdale International used to actually be a, a naval air station uh, way back, right? And, um, you know, pick almost any uh, aerospace industry, uh, they, they've got some presence in Florida, absolutely. So living in Florida, you, you, you got the bug. Can you step us through your career to date? Absolutely. So I actually started off my career at the age of 19. I enlisted in uh, the U.S. Navy, and that was a result of me not being the best student uh, coming through high school or uh, my first uh, attempt at, at university. And uh, the Navy sent me to nuclear power school where I learned to run nuclear reactors. Uh, I did that for uh, a couple of years on a, a fast attack submarine when I was, uh, where I was fortunate enough to uh, earn a slot in an officer program. 
So I went off, uh, went back to university, did much uh, better this time, earning a, a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, and then uh, off to flight school in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, I took to flying, you know, very uh, naturally. Uh, I did uh, very well in, in flight school and earned a, a jet slot. I went on uh, to jet training, uh, which I uh, did in Meridian, Mississippi earned my wings of gold and went on to fly the F-18C. So uh, did that, uh, went through training to at what we call the, um, uh, the replacement air group, um, the, the uh, training squadron, and then reported to VFA-87 for my first fleet squadron. Uh, while I was with VF-87, uh, we deployed in support of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. I was flying off the USS Roosevelt at the time. Uh, at the completion of that tour, uh, again, I was fortunate enough to uh, be selected and earn a slot for uh, Navy test pilot school. Uh, the Navy sent me off to earn my master's in aeronautical engineering first, and then off to test pilot school. I did that for a year. Uh, Upon com uh, completion and graduation of test pilot school, my first assignment was to work the F-35 program. A uh, very fortunate uh, project coming out of you know test pilot school, brand new test pilot. Uh, I did that for uh, about three years and then returned to the fleet, uh, flying uh, F-18Fs, Super Hornets, uh, forward deployed in Japan off the George Washington uh, did, uh, we lived, uh, in Japan for two and a half years and returned back to the test community, back to the F-35 program where I was heavily involved in uh, testing both the F-35B and the F-35C, but primarily the F-35C specifically, uh, preparing the aircraft to go to the aircraft carrier, uh, which culminated in me getting to take the F-35C to the USS Nimitz in November of 2014. Uh, finished up my Navy career in 2016 and was fortunate enough to be hired on, uh, or I should say join Lockheed Martin as a test pilot. And in 2018, uh, I was selected to become the Chief of Fighter Flight Ops. Uh, still get to fly the F-35, but now I, I get to lead a fantastic team of pilots, all of the fighter pilots that are currently flying for Lockheed Martin, so uh, F-16, F-22, F-35, and whatever special projects that we have come up. Fantastic. It's a tough life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they let me wear a flight suit to work, and I still get to fly high-performance high machines. So, <laughs> Yeah, best of all worlds. <laughs> exactly. So a quick side question then. Uh, did you have much to do with Billy Flynn? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know Billy very well. So Billy and I uh, overlapped at Pax River uh, when I showed up as a uh, during my second tour as an active duty uh, Navy pilot. He was working for Lockheed at the time, uh, so that would have been 2013. Uh, we worked uh, closely together on the F-35 program uh, then, and then you know naturally when I joined Lockheed Martin. Yeah, I continued to work with Billy until he uh, his retirement, and I forget the exact date, the, you know, 2018, 2019 time frame. Cool. Yeah, we've had him on the show before. I ran into him at um, Avalon, so I'm hoping to – Okay. You know, we're we're going to see if we can get him back on. He's quite happy to chat with us again, so we obviously didn't scare him off last time. <laughs> <laughs> but So you've mentioned that you were primarily on the 35 Bravo and Charlie when you were at uh, at the Navy test pilot, but I guess now you're flying all variants, aren't you? I fly all three variants at Fort Worth. Our role here at Fort Worth is to take each and every uh, aircraft as it rolls off the uh, off the factory floor and uh, take it airborne for the first time. So in this capacity, you know the the A model and the C model. The A model being the the Air Force uh, model, conventional takeoff and landing from runways, and the C model, the Navy version, the uh, CV variant. We fly two flights uh, on each of those. Uh, the B model, uh, the Stovall, the hovering aircraft, that gets uh, a third flight. Uh, but on all three variants, the first flight, we are primarily checking out the vehicle systems, right? Is the aircraft uh, built to the quality that we expect and demand 
uh, from Lockheed Martin to make sure that we're sending the best aircraft out to, you know, the war fighters, the men and women that are going to take this into to harm's way. The, the subsequent flights are used to check out our mission systems, which that's really where the magic of the F-35 uh, resides in our mission systems and sensor fusion. So we want to make sure that that's all working properly and in integrated uh, per design. And then, like I said, that B model gets a, a third flight just to check out the stowable systems. One of the one of the selling points that uh, people like Billy Flynn have t- told us about in the past, when we when we've interviewed him, is um, the idea of of making transition into or even variations between the three different variants very very similar and making it easier for the pilot. When you're the stovel aspect of the B model, of course, aside, are they, are they very different to fly between the three, or are they when you get in, is it something that's actually really seamless for you to to really adapt to? It's seamless. And I think that's one of the fantastic things that Lockheed Martin did with the F-35. Whether I'm in an A, a B, or a C, uh, they all fly almost identical. The mission systems are identical. So when I'm employing the aircraft, you know, I'm, I'm solving tactical challenges with it. It's, it's the same, right? The, really, the big difference is, you know, how they take off and land and how much fuel they carry. The, the A model carries about 18,000 pounds. The B model carries about 13,000 pounds. You, know, you give up uh, some fuel for the lift system. And then the C model, because of the, uh, the larger wings, you get a little extra uh, fuel, about uh, 18,000 pounds, uh, 19,000 pounds. And flying the B model, I mean, is, is that a heavier aircraft or is, is, is one compensated from the other in terms of less fuel versus the extra weight of the lift fan? So the the flight control system that our flight control law engineers put into this aircraft, it's it really carefree handling. So you really don't notice uh, any shift in CG or really the difference in weight. They all fly uh, almost identical, you know, and that's that's really a strength because we're already seeing it on the U.S. side with pilot exchanges, Air Force pilots going and flying different variants, you know, uh, Navy and Marine Corps pilots flying different variants. And, and then even within, you know, our allies, you know, I think it was just last year we had uh, U.S. Marine Corps B models flying uh, with the Italians off of their carrier, right? Because it's the same aircraft. So I've been fortunate enough to get into the uh, cockpit demonstrator that was going around air shows and, and um, you know, demonstrations and things like that. And just flying it with that big screen of multi-screens made up in front was pretty amazing. But I never got the chance to try an F-35, even a demo helmet, to see what it was like from the inside. How was that transition, uh, getting into the, the, the helmet and transitioning into the F-35, what, did that, what was that like? So the biggest thing that pilots will first notice, so I flew the Jehemix 1. Uh, I have not had the opportunity to fly the Joint Helmet Mounted Queuing uh, 2, uh, but I also believe uh, that's a monocular. So I went from a monocular system, one projector, Mm -hmm. to uh, a binocular system in the F-35 Helmet. So that took a, I was surprised that, that took a little bit of getting used to training your non dominant eye to, uh, you know, take in the symbology. With that being said, it, it's still a quick transition, right? So uh, one of the things that pilots will first notice is the F 35 helmet is probably the most comfortable helmet that a fighter pilot gets because one, it's custom fit to your, your head. When a pilot is selected, to uh, fly the F-35, one of the first things they do is we send them to what's called the pilot fit facility where uh, they put a latex cap over their, uh, over their head and their head is scanned uh, to map out all the ridges and divots and bumps and you know irregularities that we all have on our skull. Fortunately, they can't, you know, there's no scanning of <laughs> mental state because <laughs> it probably wouldn't let me fly. But, uh, but then that information is sent off. Your, um, your pads are uh, custom cut. They're sent back. And then you uh, come back the next day and you put the helmet on. They cut your visor so it's custom fit to you. They make sure that there's uh, no hot spots or whatever, you know, so a little tweaking of the the pads themselves so it's the best fitting helmet that i've ever worn you have uh, active noise reduction 
in the ear cups. And so that that's fantastic. You know, it's uh, like flying uh, uh, really reduces a lot of the noise. Mm. Um, but there is a there is a transition. The uh, the pilot will spend uh, the next couple of days tweaking the helmet uh, and uh, exactly where the displays are to make sure that it is uh, it's zeroed in, right? Because if you compare it to say you know the Jehemix, the field of view that is projected is much wider than the field of view that is projected on an F-35 helmet. If there, you can uh, see pictures out there where the display, the actual size of the display, it's not much larger than the human pupil, right? And, and, and that's by design. And that's another reason why the helmet has to fit so good because you can't have this thing jostling around on your head under G's or, or whenever. That, that symbology has to be available to you at, at all times. Uh, the symbology is focused for what we call infinity. So it's just a, a seamless transition as far as when you're flying, the symbology overlying with the outside world. Again, it does take a little bit of getting used to. Uh, when I first started flying, I could actually feel uh, the muscles in my eyes mm. change as, I, as the f- focal length yep. uh, varied. But now, you know, I've been flying for a number of years. It's it's seamless. I don't even notice it anymore. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, you've got that screen in front of you, plus you've also got what's on your um, on your helmet. Uh, how do the two inter, in, interrelate? Because, you know, if you, if you look down to look at the screen, is the outside view in front of your pupils or is it only when you're looking up and out? No, it's it's still there, but the the helmet itself has three – uh, different tracking systems. It has an inertial tracking system, it has a magnetic tracking system, and then it has a visual tracking system with cameras inside uh, the cockpit so that the aircraft uh, and the aircraft computers are uh, aware of where the, the pilot's head and orientation is all mm-hmm. time. So when I come in to look at the, the glass, we call it the glass, when I come in to look at the glass, the symbology is blanked. Right. Okay. Uh, The only time that we won't blank that symbology is we also have the capability to take uh, the DAS system, the six cameras around the aircraft, and project that imagery to uh, the visor. Uh, And that's really, it's it's a useful system during the day, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but as far as pilot visuals, it's used primarily at night. This system really turns night into day for the pilot. The other th- advantages of the, uh, the F-35 helmet that you kind of need to get used to is it has your night vision camera integrated into it. So when I'm flying at night, I can either turn all the visuals off, all the um, the camera views. I can have DAS. I can have my night vision camera, and I can do it all from the flick of my thumb on the stick. Fantastic. So that would really change the way you fight the aircraft in many ways, wouldn't it? I mean, it's it's all of a sudden it's taking a lot of things that perhaps you had to give a lot of thought to in, in older generation aircraft. It seems to me now that, you know, again, it's it's designed to make things easier, and I guess that, that leads through to SA and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, uh, 100%. You know, the, the helmet is just – it's another – tool that the pilot has uh, that helps uh, him or her execute the mission. And it's, it's the seamless integration of all the sensors through sensor fusion that, that's really that, that generational leap, right? So when we talk about the F-35 and we talk about it being a, a fifth-gen fighter, fifth-generation fighter, most people automatically think about stealth. And stealth is an, definitely an important aspect of it. Uh, you know, s- the stealth capability that the aircraft brings to the fight, it's both an offensive and defensive capability. Uh, but really, the other part of fifth gen is sensor fusion and what sensor fusion brings to the pilot. So, for example, when I was flying my fourth gen fighter uh, over Iraq, um, you know, the F-18... Very easy aircraft to fly, and, and that's by design. Uh, but in my legacy F-18, uh, I had to tell 
the radar, where to look, what targets to prioritize. I had to uh, interpret what my uh, RWR, EW system was displaying to me. I had to prioritize uh, you know, what my targeting pod was looking at. And more importantly, is I had to listen, actively listen to a lot of information that was coming in over the radio to fill in the rest of the information that was needed. And I would build that tactical picture in my head. So I was as much a sensor manager as a tactician, you know, in, in my fourth gen aircraft. What sensor fusion brings to the pilot is it's the sensor manager. Okay. It not only does it manage my sensors for me, but it optimizes them depending on what I do mission planning wise on the deck, right? So F-35, extremely easy aircraft to fly. And again, that's by design because that builds in safety margins for the pilot. I'm not too worried about being a sensor manager because I have sensor fusion taking care of that for me. So really what that allows me to do is be that tactician, right? To quickly analyze any tactical challenge that's presented to me. And we do that via the, the glass and the PVI and how that information is presented to the pilot. And it allows the pilot to make those split second tactical decisions that need to be made to solve any tactical challenge that's out there. I've heard the reference to the F-35 being the quarterback of the mission, uh, being up in the air with all that sense of fusion and calling the shots and giving people information and all that. So I'm guessing that keeps you pretty busy in the cockpit. Uh, what's it like to be doing that quarterback role in addition to flying and fighting the aircraft itself? So every fighter pilot wants to be the leader, right? That's that's just the nature, right? You know, it's uh, I'm the best pilot up here. I want to I want to be in charge. But what we're seeing is again, if I compare it to you know my fourth gen experience, it would typically take. Uh, a Navy pilot anywhere between eight to 12 years of experience before they got to the point where they could uh, lead uh, in the Navy, what we would call, you know, an LFE or a large force uh, em employment, you know, taking a large number of aircraft into a contested area and, and executing some sort of strike. Because of sensor fusion and be pilots are achieving that level as early as two to four years into their career. Wow. Right. So, I mean, it's that's when we talk about generational leaps, you know, that's one of the things. The services, you know, training a pilot takes a lot of resources. You know, yeah. it takes a lot of the country's resources to dedicate to each individual pilot. And they're getting a much better pilot much sooner because of the tools that take some of the workload off the pilot and allow them to be you know, the tactician that you want them to be. So when you talk about, you know, quarterback in the fight, it's one, it's, it's fun. It's exciting. <laughs> it's a, it's a challenge to your professional skills, but you know, you, you get up there and the tools that the aircraft provide you, the advanced sensors, uh, the sensor fusion, as well as the data links that, you know, we, we haven't talked about, you know, all of this information comes in and is very succinctly displayed to the pilot so that they're, again, able to make those quarterback calls. And then you bring in, you know, the added benefit of these uh, advanced data links that we have, Link 16 and, and MATL. And the information that we're bringing in is also pushed out to everybody that we want to share it with, right? Uh, so even, you know, the battlefield commanders that may be away from the forward line, uh, where the action is happening, they have the same amount of essay that the pilot in the cockpit has. Because it's really, it's really, we hear a lot about this, this being a platform rather than just an aircraft, isn't it? Like, you know, this, this is, this is now changing the way I guess the battle space is managed because it's, it's an integral part of a system rather than just an individual aircraft or a bunch of individual aircraft. So at Lockheed Martin, we're working hard on what we call 21st century security, right? Which is to, uh, uh, to bring integrated capability to uh, the warfighter, you know, to be able to uh, operate and exploit uh, what we call JADO or joint uh, joint all domain 
operation. So when we talk about 21st century security in JADO, it's talking about the integration of space assets, air assets, both uh, land and sea assets, as well as subsurface assets. And each of those entities being able to share information so that they can make the tactical decision that they need. So when we talk about the F-35, yeah, it's the F-35. It's a very capable uh, fighter aircraft, but it's also an ISR platform, uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Uh, it, and when you talk about it in uh, a JADO sense or 21st century security sense, it's an airborne data node. It's about, you know, battle management uh, or not battle management, but information management. Because one of the other aspects I failed to mention when I talked about the aspects of, of, of JADO, right? And, you know, space, air, surface, subsurface, but also cyber, mm-hmm. right? And that's, you know, having an airborne uh, data node, you know, just adds to that capability. And that's what the F-35 brings. Okay, so... Uh, I mean, you're like you're sounding like a mini AWACS right there, like a, a small E7 or E3. <laughs> uh, so, how does the F35 plug in with those AWACS platforms? Like in the Navy sense, you've got the E2. How does it supplement uh, for the Air Force talking to the E7, the wedge tail? What's what's involved there? You're not taking over, but are you able to give them more information than they'd otherwise have? Um, we we are. Um, just because of uh, the sensors and the spectrum that our our sensors operate in, uh, and again, it's because of Link sixteen and being able to to pass that information. So when you think about it, you know, if I have uh, you know a satellite with a certain capability in a certain part of the you know EM spectrum or visual spectrum mm-hmm. or whatever, and the F thirty five brings a, a different part of the spectrum, you know, to the solution and maybe a ground-based radar, you know, and we're able to feed all of this information in. And, you know, it it's a force multiplier is what it is. Our special guest this week is Tony Wilson, Chief of Fighter Flight Operations at Lockheed Martin. Stick with us, folks. We'll be right back after this. Welcome aboard the High Fly Media Podcast, dedicated to sharing the stories and experiences of the amazing people who make aviation happen. From pilots like me, to engineers, air traffic controllers and others, I'll explore their personal journeys, the challenges they've faced and the triumphs they've achieved. My name is Damien and I'll be your host. Whether you're a seasoned aviation enthusiast or new to the field, I invite you to join me as we take off on this journey of discovery. Subscribe now on your favourite podcast platform and leave a review to help spread the word. You can find me at highflymedia.com. That's H-I-F-L-Y media.com. Uncovering the people and passion behind aviation, one story at a time. Keeping up to date with the latest news is a huge part of our daily lives. Now you can have news on demand with the Australian Independent Radio News app. News and sport in your pocket whenever you want it. Wherever you are in the world, if you call Australia home, you can stay in touch with the Air News app. Download it now for news on the go. This is Air News. 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 News. Australian Independent Radio News. You're listening to Playing Crazy Down Under, the show where we talk aviation, and our very special guest this week is Tony Brick-Wilson, the Chief of Fighter Flight Operations at Lockheed Martin, the manufacturer, of course, of the F-35, uh, Tony, I, I have just one interesting side question there because um, I, I should admit that one of my guilty pleasures is getting on YouTube and watching cockpit video of carrier ops. It just I could watch it all day long. Um, I noticed when uh, you, you're talking a lot there about the ease of use and how much easier this aircraft is to fly, I wonder if you could talk about bringing it onto the boat, bringing it onto a carrier versus, say, bringing an F you know, bring an F-18 onto the boat. There seems to me to be so much going on in that cockpit, so many micro adjustments being made in the Hornet, Given that this aircraft is an easier aircraft to operate, how does that affect just coming onto the boat? It's just a side question because these videos, they just fascinate me. <laughs> so um, what I can tell you is uh, the F-35 builds huge safety margins into uh, shipboard operations. There's a couple of things that we have going for us in the F-35. Uh, and, and to be fair, it's not just the F-35. The Navy has 
uh, invested a lot of resources in uh, at bringing what the F-35 brings to the pilot uh, to the Hornet, and they're also expanding it out to other aircraft in the fleet. But in the F-35, we have what's called Delta Flight Path. And, and you're 100% right. There's you know multiple micro uh, corrections and in- inputs while you're trying to land on the ship. You know, it's um, the the task, the basic task. I can I can break it down into uh, you know the, the naval aviation mantra is uh, meatball lineup angle of attack, and what that means is you have the Fresnel lens that has the ball off to the left side, and the pilot's primary task is to keep it between the two green bars, what we call uh, the datums. The lineup is to make sure that you are on center line because the landing area on an aircraft carrier is not that big and there's aircraft <laughs> parked on either side of the landing area. So you really can't afford to be, <laughs> you know, off by very much. And then angle of attack, an angle of attack, you know, it's, it's speed. Well, the F 35 takes care of angle of attack for you, right? So I don't have to worry too much about that. Um, and now with Delta Flight Path, it automatically, once I'm on Glide Slope, I can engage it and it will capture and hold that three degree Glide Slope for me. Wow. Not only does it do that, but normally where the younger pilots will get themselves in trouble is, and, and I did, <laughs> you know, uh, many times uh, trying to come aboard the boat, is you get so focused on uh, Glide Slope that lineup will fall out of your scan and you'll, you'll pick up a drift one way or the other. And the LSOs, they'll, they'll give you, you know, a couple of seconds to see if you're going to correct it. But if you don't start to correct it, they'll tell you, Hey, you, you need to come one way or the other. And this is normally where younger pilots, um, would get themselves in trouble because as soon as I now need to make a lineup correction, I may have had the power set perfectly, but because I'm changing lift, because I'm changing the drag profile, because I'm banking the aircraft, now I got to come up on the power and now I have to reduce the power and then come back up. So it's a three part power correction and then I got to do it again the other way. And normally the pilot becomes so focused on lineup that the, or, uh, the glide slope falls out and now they end up having, yeah. you know, multiple corrections to have to make. Well, Delta Flight Path and what's called in the F-18 Magic Carpet, Mm -hmm. it helps the pilot out tremendously because if I start to uh, drift one way or the other, all I have to do now is put in lateral stick input to make that lineup correction, and the plane takes care of everything for me. It takes care of the power. You know, the F-35 has what we call... uh, triple ID IDLC integrated direct lift. So really what's happening is I'm moving the stick around. If I need to change, you know, uh, I've started to shallow out or I'm going low and I pull back on the stick. Actually the control surfaces all deflect first to change the shape of the wing, to change the camber and give me almost immediate lift. So the aircraft heaves back up. Right. So, you know, whether you're talking about the F-35 and, and like I said, the Super Hornet has this, this capability. Coming back aboard the boat, especially during the day, there's so many increased safety margins because of the capability that the uh, digital flight controls bring to the pilot. The other thing that the F-35 pilot has to him is what we call a ship's reference velocity vector. And what that is, it's a data link with the ship that actually takes into account ship's motion. And now I have a piece of symbology that I basically put it on the deck and that's where I'm going to land. So before when I was flying my legacy Hornet, we had a traditional velocity vector flight path marker. So as you came around the corner, you know, we made that approach turn during the day, you'd use a little bit of Kentucky windage and you'd put the velocity vector out in front of the ship a little bit. And, you know, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd game it that way a little bit, but between the, the symbology and the flight controls, you know, it's, I won't say it's easy. And <laughs> I, I used to say this when I flew, you know, the legacy Hornet that I would do anything that the Navy asked me to do for free, except land at the boat at night. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. They don't pay anybody enough money to do that. <laughs> but the tools that we give the pilots now, uh, again, 
it makes it easier, mm -hmm. it makes it safer, which allows them to, again, focus on the mission and not worry so much about boat operations. I know that's a side question, but uh, I tell you, we could have a whole separate podcast on carrier ops because it just – those guys, the shooters, for example, they just crack me up. I mean, the, the whole thing – we could have a whole separate podcast on that, Grant, but we should move on. Oh, a a absolutely. As a matter of fact, Ali's probably saying, don't get them started on <laughs> boat talk because you won't set them up. <laughs> well, let's uh, shift on to a slightly different question then. And you, you touched on that briefly about uh, the sense of fusion changing how you do things. Um, so how has sense of fusion changed the way you plan and execute missions, for example? I'll make a bold statement and say that it hasn't. There you go. Okay. Um, because both uh, the U.S. Uh, way of mission planning and, 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 and prepping for a mission – uh, as well as you know, our allies, we you know we, we all share that in common. And whether mission planning is always intensive, you're analyzing where the target is, what where the threats are, what the threats are, um, what are the threats vulnerabilities to my strengths, and how can I exploit that? What are my vulnerabilities to the threat, if any, and how do I defend against that, right? So all of that goes into mission planning. Sensor fusion uh, increase, increases your mission planning a little bit because you want to put information into uh, the plane in your mission planning process that's going to uh, bring sensor fusion uh, or optimize sensor fusion for whatever you're getting ready to, whatever tactical challenge you're getting ready to to go out and uh, and fly against, but more importantly, it makes things easier in the plane, right? So it really doesn't change how I um, how I mission plan. That, like I said, there's a little bit extra. But the the benefit it brings is flexibility. And what I mean by that is if the scenario doesn't go how I expect it to, and 99% of the time the scenarios don't go how you mm -hmm. expect them to, yep. there's additional threats or additional capability out there, yep. it allows the pilot to change their game plan on the fly. And, and, and change that game plan with ease. And again, it goes back to what I was saying about, you know, the difference between taking eight to 12 years to attain a certain tactical level and attain it now in two to four. Okay. Because, yeah, we all, we all know von Clausewitz, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And uh, the other one that a, a wing commander I used to work with uh, was frequently saying to me was, Grant, have I told you that flexibility wins wars? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which, which was often a signal that he had done something that I needed to correct and fix. But, you know, uh, but yeah, those, those two things. So, yeah, I, I could see what you're meaning there, that, that flexibility, that power uh, of information and ability to adapt is is critical in a especially in a dynamic war env well, environment let alone war but any environment that we're doing even even a training mission is quite dynamic so fantastic stuff so i'm going to go for bring us back into the cockpit and we've got the helmet you've told us a lot about how that all, that all works and how you got the screen um the glass as you said uh how does all this information get presented to you and and how do you identify key items at various points uh i, I imagine that are oh, you being illuminated by a radar is probably a higher priority than um exa right now than how much fuel you've got things like that but but how is that presented you see the, the videos of the super hornets and they've got screens everywhere but you've just got that the glass and the helmet so let's talk about the glass for just a second it's actually two different displays Okay, and we do that for redundancy and safety so that if you lose one display, you still have another one. But the glass itself can be broken up into uh, four portals. Um, and each of those portals can either have one display on it or uh, one larger display and two smaller ones. I can expand it out so that I've got, you know, the display going across two portals. 
right? So I have multiple ways that I can configure the, the glass for whatever the mission is. You think of it like, you know, an iPad or an iPhone as far as, you know, be, being having that flexibility. Additionally, the F-35 has five different uh, modes in it. We have navigation, air-to-air -air one, air-to-air -air two, uh, dogfight, and air-to-surface. And each of those five modes, I can set up my displays, uh, again, however I want it. So I set it up on, uh, on, on deck, and matter of fact, we're getting the capability to actually set it up in mission planning so the pilot doesn't even need to worry about setting it up on deck. So the displays are already optimized for your mode and your mode is tied to whatever your task is and it's obviously in the name of the mode right so air to air one air to air two i'm doing some sort of air to air mission dogfight you know i'm mixing it up and air to surface i'm executing uh i'm prosecuting a target on the ground now whether you're talking about you know the glass and uh you know the f-35 and a fifth gen fighter or you know, any of the other fourth gen fighters out there, one of the first tasks that a pilot needs to learn is their scan. Mm -hmm. Where am I looking for what information and when? Yep. Yeah. Right. So it, because it's, it does me no good to be looking at my T FLIR imagery if I'm trying to figure out, you know, from, uh, you know, EW or, uh, uh, energy waves coming off an aircraft, uh, you know, to help me identify it. So it's a matter of learning where to look and, and when to look. And again, technology is, is advancing, right? And there's, uh, systems out there. They're not in the F-35, uh, yet it's, you know, still being tested on, you know, multiple different helmets out there, but not only, you know, I have a camera, a mission replay camera in the helmet so I know where the pilot's head is looking. But here in the near future, not only are we going to know where the pilot's head is looking, but we're going to know where the pilot's eyes are looking. And that's just going to aid in that training aspect, right? So the instructor pilots are going to have the capability to come back and be like, oh, yeah, your your head was in the right place, but you were looking in the wrong place, right? So it's a, it's a matter of learning what to scan, and and when to scan it and that just comes with training and experience yeah we're starting to see that in simulators now where they're doing the eye tracking while you're in the sim so yeah no 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 huge surprise to hear that's going to wind up in the helmet as well <laughs> yep so in terms of maturity of the platform i mean it's been under development now for many many years how does how does Lockheed Martin see it going now? Are we are we in a in a spot where we're happy? Obviously, there's a process of continued improvement, but where does the company see the you know the the evolution of the aircraft as we sit here in 2023? So the the F-35 that's flying today is not the same F-35 that was flying in 2010. Okay, one of the great strengths of the F-35 is it is a software driven aircraft. Okay, what do I mean by that? When I was flying my fourth gen fighter, you would get a software update about every two years. Okay. And with that software update came incremental increases in capability. But for real capability increases, you had to change out boxes. It came in hardware changes. We're in the process of doing TR3, Tech Refresh 3. This is only the third time in the history of the aircraft that we are actually changing out hardware and we're doing it because computer processing power has gotten better sensors have gotten better right and when you compare that two-year software update cycle to what we push out now which is about every six months yep right and again with each new software comes new capability so when I say that the aircraft that's flying today resembles nothing of the aircraft that flew back in 2010, I'm talking about the tactical capability that the aircraft had because of all the software updates that have come along the way and now the third time that we're actually refreshing the hardware. So when you talk about, you know, what does the plane look like in 2040? What does the plane look like in 2070? The only answer I can give you is, I don't know, but I can't wait to see it, <laughs> right? 
because I know I know the new capabilities that are coming right around the corner, you know, as well as you know the future capabilities that you know Lockheed's working on, Lockheed Martin's working on, and I'm as a tactical aviator, I am excited to see what comes next. Yeah, obviously, there's so many of these aircraft flying around the world these days. I, I suppose it goes without saying that you're getting constant feedback from of all different types from all around the world on on, on different tweaks you might like to make. Absolutely. So one of the decisions that was made in the program early on was to use this idea of concurrency. So what do I mean by that? When aircraft, specifically tactical aircraft, went through, you know, their design and field process, you know, prior to the F-35 and, you know, uh, earlier, they went through distinct phases. They went through uh, you know, first the aircraft was built, some prototypes were built, and they went through developmental tests, DT. And in that time period, you know, test pilots such as myself, we flew it, we identified, you know, challenges and tweaks, you know, we, we put them in, we tested them out, we're like, okay, yes, it is past developmental flight test, now it's ready for operational tests. And then we would send it on to operational tests, and the operational testers would do their thing, right? And then they, again, they'd identify... Uh, challenges and, you know, things that needed to be addressed, it would get fixed. And then it was sent, finally sent on to the fleet, the end user, where they would eventually uh, IOC, declare IOC or initial operating capability. The F-35 program went with this idea of concurrency. And I can tell you as a developmental flight uh, or a developmental test pilot, at first it was a little bit frustrating because I was doing developmental tests and the aircraft's portion, you know, we weren't done, you know, carving out the, the full envelope and we already had operational tests going on as well as um, the services flying it operationally. And the reason I, I say it was a little bit of a challenge is because, you know, the the fleet pilot would come back or like, well, this doesn't work. And we're like, yes, we know. <laughs> and and we're work we're working on it, right? Yeah. But I, I think my my personal feeling now is that we have a much more robust system uh, in the aircraft because of uh, this idea of concurrency, because we got the end users involved in the design process, if you will, so early. So you know, instead of a, you know an idea taking legs and running and then making it out to the fleet and the fleet pilots being like, well, I'm never going to use this. <laughs> why, why would you design it that way? They were able to identify that earlier, right? So, and, and it's not just the U.S. Uh, services. It's every nation that's been part of the program, whenever they come onto the program, th- you know, they start integrating into these processes that we have to help develop the aircraft and make sure that when I make the statement that the F-35 is the most capable, the most survivable, uh, the most connected fighter flying on the face of the planet today, I can say that with confidence because I have however many pilots and country services to back that statement up. Yep. And uh, for instance, you've got ACURL, the Australian, Canadian, UK uh, reprogramming lab, which, uh, yeah, that's a major thing that's going on in the US at the moment where these non-US Five Eyes groups are, are doing their their specific programming to help develop. So that does lead into the question, the one that we're, we're being from down under that we've got to ask is, uh, have you had much to do with the, the RAF, both personnel and aircraft and so on? Have you tested any of our aircraft? Have you engaged a lot with Australian personnel? So uh, I'll answer that in two, two parts. Um, Every Australian air- aircraft that has come off of the the line, either I or a member of my team have flown it. So um, as far as integration and interaction um, with the Australians, unfortunately, uh, no, oh. I, I haven't. As a matter of fact, um, it's still on my to-do list to actually make it down to Australia uh, I was in uh, I was in the U.S. Navy. We were doing an exercise in Australia down in uh, Tyndall, and uh, it's actually that's that's where I, I earned my mission commander qual. That you know, leading uh, large forces, uh, you know, into tactical scenarios. And we were 
uh, supposed to stop in Australia, and I was super excited. This was going to be my first time, and the port call got canceled. Oh no! So, <laughs> <laughs> so heartbreaking. I've flown over. Uh, I've flown over your country. I've uh, I've dropped um, you know practice ordinance mm-hmm. on uh, on your ranges, but I've never had the opportunity to actually come down and enjoy the culture. Well, we need oh. to rectify that. <laughs> I think yeah, so. Absolutely. I <laughs> uh, will have to talk. We, we we will have to have a chat with Ali at the end of this uh, this recording. <laughs> so Tony, uh, just as we uh, come to the end of our time here, um, we we never got around to asking you about your call sign, Brick. And of course, we have to ask every fighter pilot uh, that we come across uh, how they came across their call sign. And, and can you give us the PG version? Yeah, the PG this, version. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. This this does go out to radio and kids. So <laughs> absolutely. So. Unfortunately, um, you probably can't tell from uh, from the video, but I'm a relatively short uh, pilot, uh, short and, and stout in nature. So uh, the call sign Brick, uh, especially in my younger years, was very fur- uh, fitting to uh, my build as well as my personality. Uh, you know, small, dense, uh, <laughs> rough around the e- edges. Uh, I could be abrasive. Uh, trying to get me to change uh, my mind on anything uh, was like pushing on a, a brick wall because uh, some people say I have a tendency to be stubborn. I disagree. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the, other, uh, the other story, again, with uh, being short, uh, we carry uh, basically an external hard drive mm-hmm. from mission planning out to the jet, uh, and we call that uh, the brick so one of the running jokes was, how many bricks did I have to sit on so I could see outside <laughs> the cockpit? <laughs> oh, such a cruel industry. Oh, it I'll, is. It is. Yeah. You, you got to have thick skin. Oh, yeah. And, and not just for the debriefs. <laughs> 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 well, Brick, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been awesome. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time and very conscious of the fact that we're almost at 7 p.m. on a Friday evening, your time. So that bourbon is just around the corner because we're going to wrap it here. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, I had uh, a lot of fun. You know, if I can't be uh, flying, then talking about it's the next best thing. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Look, let's be honest, sir. We've all got to eat. That we do, Kevin. Food is such a big part of life, isn't it? And talking about food can lead us to all sorts of places and all sorts of people. Yep. And every week on the Food Bites podcast, we catch up with someone who might be a TV celebrity, a high-profile sports star, a politician, could be anyone. Yeah. And we talk to them about food, their kitchen skills, or, you know, sometimes lack of, uh, life and, and love. And, Kevin, every week there's the Friday Food Poll. Oh, yes. Now, that is Food Bites with Sarah Patterson and me, Kevin Hillier. You can find us wherever you find your favourite podcast and, of course, every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock on the Ace Radio Network. You're listening to Plane Crazy Down Under, the show where we like to talk aviation and we certainly love to talk about fighter jets. In fact, Grant, this week we're talking about the F-35. And back at uh, Avalon earlier in the year, of course, uh, Lockmart had a pretty uh, big presence there in the F-35, of course, uh, you know, was the jet that's taking uh, everybody's attention. Their uh, Director of uh, International Business Development for the Jet is Stephen Over, and he joined us for an interview on our uh, our sister program. Can we call it that, Grant? The Australian <laughs> Defence Magazine podcast, and we had a great chat with him. The fine folks of the Australian Defence Magazine podcast allow us to use some of their content once it's been out on their show for a bit. Here's a few excerpts of the key pieces that fit in with what Tony was talking about before. We're incorporating an upgrade that we call Block 4. So Block 4 will span about a seven or eight year time frame. And it starts with some fairly significant hardware upgrades to our mission systems or or avionics, as we call it. Uh, uh, This year, we're breaking into production a new computing baseline that will update the main mission computer on the aircraft, the computer that supports the the cockpit displays, and the aircraft memory system. And that creates a computing infrastructure that then we can leverage with future software upgrades. We're also incorporating a next-gen distributed aperture system, this infrared camera that's positioned around the airplane that allows the pilot to see hemispherically and infrared. And uh, that new sensor, it was it was principally put on the airplane to reduce cost and be uh, more supportable, but it's going to have about a 2x improvement in detection range and detection performance. It's just a benefit of modern technology. What pilot wouldn't love that? <laughs> yeah. And 
So that, that starts the foundation. Australia's last nine airplanes that are delivered this year will have that hardware baseline. And then incrementally, year over year, there's new software upgrades that will bring new weapons, uh, additional sensor modes, and other performance features that will keep this airplane at the cutting edge, state-of-the-art military capability so that Australia, the U.S., and our allies will have the ability to deter aggression from the adversaries that are out there for decades to come. That's fantastic. And will the, the you mentioned that the last few will have that hardware um, capability. Is that plan to be re- regressively applied to the existing fleet when they come in for major upgrades? And things it like absolutely that? is. There's already a plan that we and the F-35 Joint Program Office have worked with the Australian Air Force uh, to factor their airplanes into a a depot mod program at RAAF Williamtown. And uh, over the coming years, their airplanes will all be upgraded to this common Block 4 baseline. Let's touch on sensor fusion. Well, as an engineer, I can tell you sensor fusion is probably the most advanced state-of-the-art feature of the F-35. And I've, you know, focused on how do you describe to people that aren't fighter pilots, what centrifusion is. And the way I would relate it is you have to contrast it with what a pilot that flies a fourth generation airplane is doing versus a pilot that's flying the F-35. So the pilot that's flying a fourth generation airplane, the Australian Air Force has some of the finest fourth generation airplanes in the world with both classic and super I guess the classics have been retired. Um, We produce one of the finest fourth generation airplanes also in the world, the F-16 Fighting Falcon. Great fourth gen airplane, right? And so the pilot instinctually he knows how to fly the airplane. He doesn't have to think mm. about how to control and maneuver the aircraft. That's just instinctual for him. And so he has a dedicated display for each and every sensor he has mm-hmm. in the cockpit. He has a radar and a dedicated display that shows him radar targeting. He'll have electronic warfare and a dedicated display that shows him what his electronic warfare system is seeing. And if he has the luxury of an infrared tracking system or some kind of infrared uh, detection system, he may have a third display mm-hmm. that shows him what that's, that sensor is seeing. And most of his mental capacity is spent trying to glue it in his mind mm-hmm. what each of these three or four displays are showing him into a three-dimensional picture of the battle space. With F-35, we've taken the power of modern computing and almost 9 million lines of software source code, and we've automated that functionality for the pilot. So what he sees when he sits in the cockpit is this large panoramic cockpit display. It's about the size of two large iPads, and he'll typically have half of it dedicated to something we call a tactical situation display. It's this God's eye view of the battle space. And he doesn't worry about individual sensors any longer. He doesn't worry about a radar. He doesn't worry about electronic warfare. He doesn't worry about infrared. It just all logically appears uh, on his cockpit display. And he he, he never has to worry about it as he's approaching the battle space. He'll set range scales Mm -hmm. and targets just magically appear. Uh, Pilots that, that have transition from fourth generation airplanes into to F-35, they will also tell you one of the things that's the biggest surprise to them, not only is how well sensor fusion tells you where everything is in the battle space, but how well the intrinsic features in the airplane also derive combat ID. Yep. Powerful, powerful performance from, from the airplane, right? So you not only know typically where everything is in the battle space, but for the most part, you know what everything is yeah. as well. Yeah. And so if you're flying the airplane, it's a significant workload reducer. You're not trying to create a mental image of the battle space. You have this very logical view. And so the pilot becomes a tactician. Mm. And what we're seeing as this airplane is being put in the hands of seasoned military pilots is even young first lieutenants, second lieutenants that have just transitioned to the F-35 are able to be battle space commanders. Yeah. Because they have the bandwidth, they have they have the omniscience of what's happening in the battle space. They're making fourth generation airplanes better that are collaborating with them. Well, there you go. And of course, uh, Grant, you can find uh, the full interview there in episode 42 of the Australian Defence magazine. You can find that at uh, australiandefence.com.au. And uh, we do thank them for allowing us to use that audio in this program. Uh, of course, we do very proudly produce that program on their behalf. So it's, it's always great to be able to, uh, you know, uh, get some content out and run it in this show as well. 
Fantastic. Certainly is, mate. And uh, a lot of fun producing the Australian Defence Magazine podcast as well. But, uh, mate, it does cover more than just aviation, but I think this episode has been chock full of of content, as our friends in the US would like to say. And uh, it's probably time we start looking at wrapping this one up. We do indeed. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Of course, uh, we'd love to hear what you think about the F-35. Uh, lots of people have lots of things to say about it. We certainly hope that programs like this allow people to get a, a much more detailed uh, view on just what's going into that jet and, and some of the amazing technology in it. It, it really is amazing. Contact at planecrazydownunder.com is uh, where you can drop us a line and we'd certainly love to hear from you on all sorts of topics about aviation. Uh, we'll keep the posty uh, away from the mailbox <laughs> this week because time is a little bit against us, but uh, we'd certainly love to hear from you. Thanks very much for for joining us. Thanks to uh, Lockheed Martin for uh, providing us with the opportunity to get these interviews. We really do appreciate it. Grant, we'll be back uh, with another episode very, very shortly. Yeah, I think you're right there, mate. And uh, there's some great content already recorded, some just about to be recorded and, oh, lots more in the queue. <laughs> we'll be back very soon. Of course, the Gold Coast uh, Pacific Air Show has just been uh, run as we uh, as we record this one. We'll have a wrap-up of that show in the next episode. So uh, keep an eye on the feed. Steve Vischer and Grant McHeron wishing you very safe flying folks and we'll talk to you again very soon find show notes for this episode along with our contact details and a full back catalog of shows at plainecrazydownunder.com drop us a line anytime with feedback story suggestions or advertising inquiries we'd love to hear from you title music is you name it by brian simpson plain crazy down under is a southern skies media production Southern Skies Media.